time for our next speaker. Um, and our next speaker will be introduced by Margot Brouwer, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Kaplan Institute in Groningen. Margot. Thank you, Kuhn. Well, of course, uh, Eric Verlinde barely needs any introduction because he's well known and also because he has been a keynote at every Information Universe conference so far. But I will try my best regardless. So um, yeah, Eric started as a physics student at the University of Utrecht, where he wrote his master thesis with Nobel Prize winner Gerard het Hoofd and his PhD thesis with Professor Bernard de Witt. And after holding positions at the University of Princeton, at CERN, and also in Utrecht, he became a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Amsterdam. And there he formulated his theory of emergent gravity, uh, for which he received the Spinoza Prize, the most prestigious scientific distinction in the Netherlands in 2011. And it is in the context of this theory, which he will discuss with us today, that I started my collaboration with him. And I want just to shortly tell the story of the first time I came to his office about five years ago, because it illustrates one of the great qualities that I admire most about Eric, which is uh, his out of the box thinking. Now, as a second year PhD student, I was of course very nervous to be invited by a world famous professor. So I had everything meticulously prepared and I was dedicated to write down everything he would say. However, as Eric started explaining his theory to me, I discovered with a shock that my pen was not working. So with a very red face, I asked uh, Professor Verlinde to pause his explanation while I searched for a new pen. Fortunately, I found one in my bag and Professor Verlinde continued. But to my even bigger surprise and horror, the second pen was also not working. So with an even redder face, I stopped Professor Verlinde again to search for a third pen. But Eric, and here comes the out of the box thinking part, he looked straight at me very seriously and said, then it must be the paper. <laughs> and well, this is of course a very great analogy to Eric's approach to the whole dark matter problem, because uh, well, while many believe that there must be something within our universe which causes the excess gravity, Eric proposes that the problem lies with the fabric of space-time itself. To which I say, indeed, when you're reaching for your third pen and the problem is still not solved, then maybe it is just the paper. I'm glad to give the word to Professor Eric Verlinde. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, so yes, I'm going to again uh, shift gears a bit because, well, first of all, I'm, I'm uh, not an observationist, I'm a theorist, and I'm indeed going to present you some uh, work, I mean, some ideas that, that come from the theory of emergent gravity. I have a short amount of time, and it's not uh, possible to explain all the theoretical aspects. And certainly, a lot of things have happened in, in the past years. And not just by me. I mean, many people in my field are, are thinking about the relationship between gravity, space, time, and information. I mean, this is why it's also uh, good to talk about this in the context of the information universe. In particular, uh, the connection between gravity and space, time, and quantum information has featured in, in many works and also attracted a lot of attention in, in the public uh, uh, media. I mean, there's uh, a lot of uh, talk about connections with quantum entanglement and space-time. It goes under the slogan of ER equals EPR. And uh, people have even uh, ways of deriving gravity from uh, microscopic laws associated to this, this uh, quantum entanglement. So there is a new view on gravity and space-time appearing, uh, but I have to say, unfortunately, this mostly is done in a universe, or at least in, in a model universe that doesn't look like our, ours. 
So uh, this talk is going to be trying to generalize, at least apply some of those ideas to a universe that looks like ours, in which there is indeed a, um, a dark energy and, and, and a positive cosmological constant, unlike in the case that people mostly consider. A central role in all of these developments is played by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, I mean, it's a famous formula that expresses the entropy of a black hole as the area of its uh, horizon. Uh, this formula has now, in the recent discussion, uh, actually, should not be a pi in the denominator. Anyway, in the recent discussion. Um, can, I, can I just check? Uh, we, we're not seeing any slides. Are you? Oh, am I doing this wrong? Um, I thought I shared my. Um... I don't know who you shared it with, but not with us. Ah. How do I do this now? Um, share screen. I clicked on this share. You now see something appearing. Now I see a whole bunch of slides. And then I go from the beginning. Let me see. Uh, sorry. Where do I do a slideshow? Play from the start. Now you Great. see it? Yes. Yeah, so this was indeed uh, the, the public attention and media for, for all kinds of things happening in, in uh, connection between space time and quantum information. This last picture is, is, is uh, expressing the EPR is ER a relationship between wormholes and, and entanglement. And as I said, there are many people working in this area. And the central element in this, and now I think you can see the slide, I hope, uh, is the beckenstein hawking formula, which expresses the entropy of a black hole in terms of its area um, of the horizon. The same formula actually has features in these developments uh, where it has a slightly different role. Actually, we have interpreted this area formula as measuring the entanglement intermediate, quantum entanglement that's contained in, in the, in the space-time itself when you view it from a microscopic perspective. And this is uh, well understood in a universe uh, which is not like our own, namely with a negative cosmological constant, where we have a microscopic theory. And this is uh, well known as the ads cft correspondence. We like to now sort of generalize these ideas to a, a more realistic setting where there is uh, indeed in the cosmological space time, which uh, expands and has the, the, the usual uh, dark energy in it. When you add dark energy, you get a uh, sitter space. I mean, if you have only dark energy, actually it is pure sitter space. Uh, but what I uh, first want to explain to you is indeed how this uh, new developments actually uh, lead to a way of understanding the, the uh, origin of gravity. This is what emergent gravity uh, actually is about is namely, uh, there's a way of uh, viewing the Einstein's equations basically as a version of the first law of thermodynamics, where we think about this entropy that's featured in, in the first law as the entanglement entropy in, uh, in the sense of, of the horizon entropy that we have here. And um, so from a first law where you say the change in energy is related to the change in entropy, uh, we can actually derive Einstein's equations from this microscopic perspective. This is done in, in this uh, anti sitter space, but we can actually argue that the same kind of equations should hold in, in, in other space times, in particular in, in our, uh, our universe. So there is a way in which we should think about general relativity as being derivable from an underlying microscopic quantum theory, and that's the basic idea of quantum gravity, of emergent gravity, I should say. So indeed, as I said, we want to apply this to our, our universe. And then you can indeed ask, well, what is the entropy we're done talking about? Well, there are black holes, which carry a lot of entropy together. Uh, there's also entropy in, in, in the CMB and in other, well, uh, visible aspects of the universe. But there's also, and this is what I'm going to argue, a lot of entropy contained in, in the invisible dark part. In particular, the presence of the dark energy uh, gives rise to a, uh, well, a, a similar setting as for black holes, namely something like a horizon. In particular, if there is only dark energy in the universe, we have a, a, a cosmological horizon. And if you calculate its entropy, you can use the same formula that, that Bekenstein and Hawking wrote down. Uh, but now the uh, size of the horizon is determined actually by the, by the Hubble constant. 
And so there's the relationship between the, the, the amount of entropy, the total entropy in, in this universe and uh, the value of the Hubble parameter. Uh, in fact, the Hubble parameter also determines the temperature that's associated to the horizon. And so uh, when we think about emergent gravity in the context of uh, cosmology and in, in an expanding universe, you actually expect this parameter H0 to play a role in the theory because it actually controls the amount of uh, entropy uh, that, that is contained in, in the universe. And so uh, the entropy and temperature are due to the positive dark energy. And actually uh, what I assumed in my, my description of, of emergent gravity actually is that it's carried by the dark energy. The dark energy is actually not something that is just described by a cosmological constant in this theory, but it should actually be have a microscopic description with a, a number of states and a number of well, total entropy actually that should be given by this expression. And if you evaluate this with the value of the current uh, Hubble parameter, you would get indeed to a number of the order of 10 to the 120 or even higher. So that's an enormous entropy that is not taken into account in any standard description of cosmology. So what could be possible consequences? Let me first uh, just uh, tell you about, well, the test of general relativity that have been done. I mean, we of course have, have very precise ways of uh, measuring and even verifying uh, general relativity. In particular, all the, the recent uh, uh, successes with gravitational waves and, and other uh, systems that have sort of been looked at, they are generally uh, for strong gravity. Uh, namely, here I have a plot where I, here on the positive axis, I, I have uh, the curvature, which is kind of a measure for, well, it's, it's uh, expressed in terms of the, the, the mass density, basically, in a site, a certain volume. Uh, if that is very high, uh, gravity is well described by general relativity, but when it becomes low, uh, we have, uh, well, modifications uh, that are required, like adding dark energy and adding dark matter. Uh, on the other axis, by the way, I write down the potential and uh, you see indeed also here there is a, a, a limit where we go to the black holes where the potential, the gravitational potential reaches one, that's where the horizon is sitting. And it's in this area that we have, uh, well, a dark sector uh, in, in our description. Now, uh, if you look at the, um, oh, what am I doing? Yeah. If you look at uh, these two lines where the dark matter and the dark energy becomes important, both actually are determined, and this is kind of surprising, by the value of the, the current uh, Hubble parameter. Uh, namely, uh, this line here is where the energy density sort of uh, is of the same order as uh, what the critical density of the universe would be. And this is where the um, Dark energy, of course, becomes important. But here there's another line, which is actually a, a, a limit on the acceleration. Because if you look at these two quantities that have been plotted here, this straight line is actually an inequality on the um, acceleration, which is also bounded by something expressed in the Hubble constant. This, of course, is related to the scale of the acceleration scale that we also see in, in um, um, uh, galaxy rotation curves, as I will explain in a minute. So what is uh, very clear is that general relativity works well here, but here we have uh, the need of adding uh, dark matter and dark energy. And what I'm going to argue actually is that indeed, when we understand uh, this theory of emergent gravity, that we should be able to, of course, derive general relativity. But in this area, there may be uh, ways in which we have to include these Hubble constant and the fact that there's the entropy associated with the dark energy. And I uh, propose indeed that the dark matter and the dark energy are actually together uh, a part of a, a, a microscopic description that are, uh, well, should include indeed a description of all of the entropy that we have uh, in this universe of in, in the dark energy as well. And it may actually explain uh, some of these uh, phenomena. In particular, uh, there's uh, uh, indeed, as I explained, there's a, a phenomenology, it's due to Milgram, that uh, shows that there's in the galaxy rotation curves a uh, typical uh, uh, acceleration scale. Uh, this has recently been put in the form of a radial acceleration relation uh, due to McGuff and, and, and collaborators. Uh, so I've plotted here uh, an observed uh, acceleration uh, and a uh, 
well naive acceleration that follows from just the baryons. And there is a relationship between these two quantities. Uh, normally you would expect that the observed acceleration also includes a component uh, due to the dark matter. So there's uh, an increase in here. I mean, without dark matter, these two of course would be equal, and this is this line. But the deviation that we see here between the logarithm of the observed acceleration and the logarithm of the, the baryonic acceleration is this radial acceleration relation, which has been measured here for a, a set of uh, galaxies that were selected here. I mean, they have um, uh, a large set of uh, galaxies that, that uh, obey all this relation if you put them all together. And in particular, there's this uh, scaling relation um, for large values of R, where the observed acceleration squared is of the order uh, of the acceleration and this ex other acceleration scale that is involving uh, the Hubble constant. This I would call the, the Mont uh, phenomenology and indeed it sort of plays an important role in, in sort of fitting or explaining some of these things using this uh, kind of uh, ident uh, relations. But anyway, this relation is a, a observed relation and should be explained by any, any theory. And indeed, uh, using the ideas of emergent gravity, I found a way of trying to explain this uh, in, uh, well, taking to account this entropy associated to dark energy. I have no uh, time to explain this in detail. I'll just want to show you a formula uh, that I derived, uh, which involves this temperature actually that uh, is due to the sit in the sitter space. There's also an entropy uh, that is actually an entropy formula due to Bekenstein as well. And the left-hand side is uh, actually the gravitational energy uh, contained in, uh, in a certain part of the space-time. So with the left-hand side, we're integrating the acceleration squared up to a certain distance. And then you find this relation. Actually, the same relation if you differentiate with respect to R actually uh, would uh, be this, uh, what we have here. You see the observed squared and uh, the baryon actually is on the right hand side. That's uh, the same expression as I have here because this M is indeed the mass uh, contained in the baryons in a, a galaxy, uh, say up to a certain radius R. Now, uh, this is uh, true for galaxies, but I want to uh, extend this to a cosmological setting. So um, first, let me for, uh, tell you that uh, the, ra the radial acceleration relation has been tested recently. Actually, Marco uh, showed me some nice plot they have uh, using the data from uh, the KITS collaboration. They use the weak gravitational lensing to look at isolated galaxies. Uh, namely, this relation that I showed you on the previous slide is actually valid for that situation. And this uh, are the data that McGuff and others had but it turns out that if you uh, extend uh, the range by using weak gravitational lensing, this whole relationship continues to much larger distances. Uh, and he here they indeed uh, combine all these data and also uh, compare to, uh, well, uh, other uh, methods. I mean, uh, Marco should be the one uh, explaining precisely what's in this plot. What I just want to show here is that indeed this relationship that I just showed you has uh, been tested uh, in, in quite a large uh, range of orders of magnitude. And this is uh, from a paper that's about to appear uh, here. Um, but again, this is not yet cosmological distances. Uh, we got gonna go even further. I mean, I wanna apply it to cosmology uh, by uh, indeed rewriting this equation that I had in terms of uh, mass densities for the dark and uh, matter. Uh, and uh, this relation that I had between the acceleration uh, and, and the dark and the baryonic matter can actually be rewritten in this form. What I've done here is I've introduced uh, average um, mass densities by basically taking the integrated mass and writing it in this form. You just divide by the volume. Uh, there's also a slow parameter which has to do with how concentrated the, the, the baryons are. And then uh, this relation can be rewritten in this form. And this is the way I'm gonna actually uh, generalize it because here we have a relationship between the dark matter density and the baryonic uh, matter density. And I've also introduced this critical density, which is the usual uh, expression that we know from cosmology. This relationship holds for a large uh, cosmological distances. I mean, for large structures like clusters or uh, galaxies, uh, but even larger distances we can go to. 
by imagining that we go to the entire universe. And this would involve putting this radius r to the uh, size uh, of the Hubble radius. And actually that means that this uh, product actually goes to one. And this is the formula that I'm gonna use to have a, um, a description uh, that we can compare to uh, well, cosmological observations and actually cosmological evolution. Because if I just divide by uh, the, the critical density, I get what is called the omega, uh, the, the, the abundances for the dark matter and for the baryons. And this equation for cosmology would imply this relation. And of course, you may ask, well, does this hold? Um, indeed, it actually is quite surprising that if you go to the values that are being determined by Hubble and, and uh, sorry, by uh, the Planck and the um, W map, this relation holds uh, surprisingly well. Uh, here, this is a plot where I've uh, indeed uh, put this relation for the dark matter and the baryonic uh, components uh, in the universe. Uh, so that would be this square root relation. And this is where the data are sitting. And it's kind of surprising that it works so well. I mean, I didn't expect this to be, and uh, this is something that, that uh, well, maybe should be understood better uh, and certainly uh, requires further study because you may immediately ask, well, if this relation holds today, because these are the values actually of the, the matter uh, and the dark matter densities uh, today, uh, of course, during the evolution of the universe, uh, these numbers change, and you may wonder whether this relation can hold, because, I mean, we know that baryons, uh, they have a certain uh, dependence on, on the size of the universe, but the dark matter here seems to be doing a different thing. And indeed, this is what I'm going to uh, uh, discuss in, in, the, in the remaining part uh, of the talk. Uh, so what about cosmological evolution? And here I have to uh, actually we have a little of a disclaimer. I mean, it's not like I can derive all of this uh, from a, a full theory. I mean, there's uh, clear work to be done uh, in order to uh, describe or even be able to be, um, discuss the cosmological evolution in a theory of emergent gravity, because we don't have a microscopic quantum theory yet. And we don't have even a, a very good understanding of this uh, value of the Sitter entropy and its temperature. And so we're still waiting to find this uh, microscopic theory. We also then need to derive these emergent gravitational laws and then rewrite them in terms of uh, dynamical equations that would describe the cosmological evolution. All of this has not been done yet and it may actually take us quite a while before we dare. What I'm gonna do here is actually take a much more simple approach. Uh, I want to indeed learn some lessons maybe from observations, uh, in particular, uh, we just heard from, from Wendy uh, about the tension and, and the uh, values of the Hubble constant. Uh, I mean, there are other tensions actually between C and B measurements and low redshift observations. Maybe there are hints about uh, how we should indeed uh, maybe describe these equations. And maybe there are indeed deviations from the, from the, the Lambda CDM uh, situation. Anyway, motivated by these questions, I will take a very simple approach. Uh, namely, I will take the relation that I uh, wrote down for you for between the effective dark matter density and the baryonic density and just uh, extend this to the cosmological situation and see what that gives me. And indeed, the motivation might be to sort of see if there's a way of uh, well, maybe uh, reconciling uh, these uh, well, or at least resolving this discrepancy that now uh, seems to be there um, between the values of these uh, Hubble constants. And of course, there could be observational systematic errors uh, that explains it, but I'm gonna be uh, taking the theorist point of view that there may be a, a, a theoretical uh, well, explanation of that there's something that needs to be modified to the, to the Lambda CDM uh, to, uh, well, explain this discrepancy. And it's quite, quite natural, of course. Uh, I told you there's a different uh, way of thinking about the dark matter components. Um, and maybe that indeed changes the evolution equations in a way that might actually uh, um, explain this discrepancy. Because in order to go from the CMB data to the, to the current data, uh, people use the, the Lambda CDM equations, the Friedman equations with the, the usual uh, 
evolution equations for dark matter and, and, uh, and the other components. So I'll uh, see what that brings uh, by, by doing the following. So what I will do is first of all, I will assume that um, I can use the standard Friedman Robinson Walker equations. So there are all the components. Uh, there is a baryons, there is um, the radiation component and there's a cosmological constant, but I will introduce an effective uh, dark matter uh, density. Uh, but that dark, effective dark matter density is not an independent function. It's actually related to the other components by the equation I had before. Namely, it's the square of the dark matter density is related to the product basically of uh, the two um, um, how to say of, of the so the square of the dark matter density actually is related to, to the, the, the baryonic density times uh, a Hubble expansion uh, parameter and the Hubble expansion I indeed identify basically just with this a dot over a so it's the same equation I had before uh, on one of the previous slides and this is that actually the, the answers I will take is namely that I'll take just these equations, but I will also uh, um, impose this condition for the dark matter density and just see what that gives me. And you will find actually uh, that uh, the dark matter uh, will indeed evolve in a, in a different way. And it will actually depend on, on the cosmological era that I'm in. I mean, we know that there is a late uh, expansion of the universe dominated because of the the lambda term, the dark energy. Uh, there is a, a matter dominated period when the matter uh, is the largest component. And then there is uh, radiation domination. And we'll see that the dark matter effective density actually behaves uh, uh, differently in those different uh, periods. So this is just by uh, playing with the equations in the sense that I just put this in, in Mathematica, I put uh, the, the ratio of what would be the dark matter density according to this emergent gravity theory and that of lambda cdm and i calculated how that evolves uh, as a function of redshift and so uh, you'll see actually that um, when we are in the matter dominated area actually the dark matter indeed behaves like matter uh, however, in the late universe, when the dark the energy is dominating, actually the, the dark matter component will increase. And so the amount of dark, dark matter actually in, in the dominated matter dominated area is actually smaller than what would be happening in, in lambda CDM because the lambda CDM value would of course be equal to one. So I've reduced that, but then earlier in the universe in particular around the time of uh, where the CMB is being produced, this is around a redshift of 1,000 uh, or say 1,100. We actually get back to one again. So I do recover a dark energy, dark matter density that's the same as that of lambda CDM around the time of the CMB and of the present time. But there is an intermediate time when it seems to be a less of an important component. Whether this is indeed the thing that explains the, the Hubble uh, tension, uh, <laughs> still to be seen and I'll say a little bit more about it in, in the next uh, slides. Um, so this is indeed a plot of what the Hubble parameter would look like um, for emergent gravity theory and lambda CDM. Um, I've actually indeed taken the initial uh, values uh, such that it indeed sort of can explain the discrepancy. So what I did actually, I uh, take the present day value this is the one that would have followed from, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the, the lambda CDM, which is smaller. So this is actually this, this uh, five sigma difference. But then what I wanted to test is that if I evolve back to the time of the CMB, that I get again a ratio of the order of one. That's actually true. And indeed it has to do with the way that the dark matter behaves uh, as a function of redshift. Um, there are further tests you have to do because it's not only explaining the Hubble uh, parameter, you also like to explain, of course, the parameters of the C and B. And there's one important constraint. So this is a picture, this is actually a slide I borrowed from Lisa Randall, who also worked on the Hubble tension. Uh, and uh, she um, made clear that there's, of course, a, uh, I mean, many people know this, of course, that there is a, a very important constraint on any change of uh, the lambda CDM, is that you should uh, leave and still explain the, the um, observations of the CMB. I mean, the, 
what happens when you look at the, the sky and, and in the CMB, there's a certain a typical angles at which fluctuations uh, appear. Uh, in particular, there is something called uh, the first peak or the, the sound horizon that we see in the uh, CMB fluctuations which is some angle that depends on, uh, well, our point of view. I mean, the light has to travel back all the way to the, the surface of last scattering. And also uh, there was a uh, evolution of the universe that uh, created these um, fluctuations from, from uh, acoustic oscillations. And so there's a way that this parameter depends on the Hubble parameter or the Hubble, even the evolution of the universe. And the expressions are like this. We have uh, a sound horizon, which is uh, where these peaks will appear. The first peak uh, is namely the distance that, that any sound travels in the early universe. So we start from a very high redshift, actually infinite redshift to uh, some decoupling. Some, some This would indeed be where the CMB is being formed. And you integrate this and you include also the, the sound velocity uh, then there's also the distance that the light travels to this, and uh, this is a similar expression uh, from now to the to the surface. So this is basically this time, and then the angle is the ratio between the two. Now, what you need to verify is that if I change the values for h, because that's what I'm saying, that uh, emergent gravity theory would have a different uh, evolution of the universe, then you would change these uh, numbers. However, this ratio is something we can measure. And therefore that should not uh, depend on, uh, I mean, it should not change. So any change of the Lambda CDM theory should uh, leave this number invariant because this is something we have uh, already uh, experimentally or observationally determined. But I can change H, so not just, uh, you cannot just change it in one of those quantities, you have to change them together in such a way that this uh, remains constant. And this is what I want to test then for uh, the equations I showed you. Again, these are just plots again of uh, these quantities. This was the distance that the light travels from now to the, to the whatever, the observation, say, of the CMB. Uh, so it's a quantity that depends on the redshift. And I can take the ratio again of what happens for the emergent gravity theory and the lambda CDM theory. And you see there's a certain uh, way that uh, this distance is actually larger uh, for the emergent gravity theory by about a factor of 1.5 uh, and that sort of stays flat. So in the early universe, so the, yeah, the light travels actually far further. Now I can also use that this, this other quantity because I had two quantities in here and the ratio needs to be fixed. So I'll also plot this other one, which is the sound horizon uh, for the emergent gravity and the, and the lambda CDM theory. So this is this quantity again. Again, that uh, goes up for as a function of redshift. I'm going to do this again. So I, I take the, the function that um, depends on this parameter set and I plot it as a function of the redshift. You see it here it goes up and then it goes down. But the interesting value we have to look at is around the decoupling, which is a redshift of all about 1100. And then we have to have a ratio that sort of goes back to the one we had before. And this is what I want to end with. Indeed, it seems that with the parameters that I have uh, found, actually, of course, there's a little bit of fits you need to do. You can actually make this ratio close to one in the, in the correct period uh, range where we have to be, namely, the, this is where the CMB must uh, be. And uh, anyway, this is what I wanted to show you is that there's uh, at least uh, a chance that uh, a different evolution of the um, dark matter density could, um, well, leave many features of the lambda CDM the same, but uh, it may actually uh, well lead on some interesting predictions and even also some other uh, deviations from from the, the standard some uh, cosmological scenario. So I, I want to not end with conclusion actually because I want to sort of go back to the kind of disclaimer I had. I mean, it's clear that. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done before we have a full theory of emergent gravity for cosmology. Uh, and that we can really verify that this is also, uh, well, the correct description. I've made a simplifying assumption uh, to, to analyze this. So this, uh, well, you can view it as a prediction, but it's a prediction that is based on assumptions that may turn out to be sort of not fully uh, realized in the theory eventually. But anyway, this is where I want to uh, end. I mean, this is uh, just uh, some work in progress in that sense, but there's uh, at least, uh, 
maybe reason to think about uh, the deviations that well emergent the theory of emergent gravity would give to the standard cosmological uh, evolution thank you thank you very much eric uh, also a virtual applause for you um let me ask the first question we're going to have to keep the question session fairly short because of the the timing of the the second session of this this mini conference uh, but i was wondering whether you've whether you there's any progress on modeling one of the other great successes of the lambda cdm model which is the the structure of the peaks in the cmb not just their location but the the odd even um amplitude behavior which which conventionally really points to there being a collisionless component in the in the matter that is a very good question, of course. Uh, the, I mean, what I've done in this approach indeed is assume that the, I'm actually this is the way I formulated even, that there is some effective dark matter density. And uh, if I would have to derive the CMB uh, spectrum, uh, I would actually in a certain way treat it in the same way, that there is a component, which I just showed you. I've showed you in these equations, there is some uh, ingredient in the, um, in the equations that behaves like dark matter. And this is where you indeed have to sort of uh, yeah, complete the theory to have then the, the, the same um, generation of the peaks and the odds and the even ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, there is a dark matter component in this uh, approach, which might do the same thing. But I have to admit that and that more work needs to be done before we have the full uh, description there. And there's not a, a fully new uh, way yet of thinking about uh, the CMB measurements. I do not see, I see a raised hand, uh, Alexander Shulevsky and then Jan Tauber. Alexander, go ahead. Yes, thank you. So uh, Eric, uh, you mentioned uh, that you were using Mathematica and I was just wondering whether you have read that there was a series of, I can call them papers because they were published online, but kind of in a personal space of the, uh, uh, of the founder of the company which produces the software package where he argues that basically gravity is emerging and everything from uh, simple computations which are made by the universe and they generate space time. And if you have read them, what do you think about this theory and how does it possibly connect to what you are proposing? Thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, of course, you're talking about Stephen Wolfram. I mean, uh, he has uh, this idea for a long time that there is some uh, description as a cellular automaton, uh, space-time sort of or the whole universe basically is a cellular automaton. There is some relationship, uh, although I do think that that these ingredients that I'm uh, uh, talked about about the Bekenstein Hawking formula and things like that are kind of missing from his approach. His approach. Uh, I know that uh, my my uh, advisor, I mean Gerard at Hoofd, he actually has uh, um, uh, also. Uh, well, propose similar things. Actually, there is some uh, this cellular automaton approach seem to resonate with his ideas. I don't think they're fully developed yet. I mean, uh, and it would be interesting to compare. Um, I'm actually going to be on a conference about a, a month from now where Stephen Wolfram will also be uh, taking part, and we maybe we'll indeed learn more about what would be the relationship between these different approaches. Anyway, I'm a little skeptical in the sense that I feel that he has not included some of the more recent developments and more recent insights that we have uh, had and that I already mentioned in the beginning. Uh, I seem to be missing that from his uh, description. Okay, thanks. And then the final question is from Jan Tauber, but please try to keep the discussion short because... Uh... <laughs> okay, um, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Very good. I, I was just wondering about lensing. One of the things we can measure with the CMB, of course, is the lensing potential, which peaks at redshifts of about two or so. And I noticed that you're matching uh, your formulation to very early times and very late times, but not in the middle. It doesn't seem to match very well. So how, how, would, how would that work? That's a very good uh... A question also. I mean, one thing that I've done is sort of describe the cosmological density. What you're talking about are more the concentrated densities, probably near near clusters or or uh, so. What you um, but if there's any data that indeed can determine the the ratio of the dark matter component to the baryonic matter in say redshift two, 
I would be very interested to know this because that is indeed uh, uh, one of the ways this, in, in which these equations can be tested. But maybe I'm not well enough aware of those uh, observational data. Well, I'm not an expert either. I was just wondering if you had thought about that. No, but the, the way that Lansing works, and it is also the way that, that Maho and collaborators have sort of assumed this, is that indeed the, the effective dark matter density that I calculated basically behaves in the same way as a, a source for, for the gravitational uh, field, uh, and therefore would also curve uh, light in the same way that it would go in GR with dark matter. Okay, well, that should do it in principle, I suppose. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Eric, and all the people contributing to the discussions. Thanks to all the earlier speakers of this session. And um, that's it for this session. The second half, I think, begins on time at quarter past, unless one of the organizers tells us otherwise. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm signing off after a very nice session. Thank you.